Who's Catherine Fouget? Uh, you know, I would say I'm probably very earnest. That's the first thing that I describe myself like earnest, romantic, I'm hopeful. Um, I have a bit of a savior complex, I suppose. I want to help people and save some things, some past, some mistake, make good of something. Hold on one second. You went to UC Riverside on a full scholarship. What was the scholarship for? Uh, it was actually a women's group that were helping women. Uh, it was a journalist. Uh, I was minoring in journalism, and they were helping female journalists, actually. So it was a very big honor. What was your, what was Catherine Puget's plan um, the day after she graduated UC Riverside? I moved to L.A. <laughs> Literally packed my bags. I wanted to be part of a bigger artist community and work in theater. And I worked in a lot of theater, but it's not as big in L.A. as one of them. So I ended up parlaying that into film and television. It was always to work in the arts. I didn't have a big, um, I don't have a lot other than that. I'm not a jack of all trades. I'm very artistic, very verbal, very much interested in what pictures or stories can do and being a storyteller. So it had to always be in that area. Um, you said that when you changed majors in college, there was a lot of tears and comments from your family. <laughs> um, what was the reaction when you left Sony to become a writer? Okay, well, that's two different questions. <laughs> Let's see. Well, the first, the family thing, the why it was interesting is I was in theater at a very young age. I was, the first play I did, I was six, and it was an ensemble of Molly Brown at Community Theater. And I was bit by the bug and was in plays all my life. All through high school, I, I played, um, I was in the Star Spangled Girl as the lead, and was in musicals, always, always in theater. So when I majored, when I entered college, I majored in theater, and it was my grandfather who said, that's not a career. And he's the one who really said, you need to major in law or something with a business, you know, a set business uh, goal, and then you can do this on the side as a hobby, a career. So, and I, I understand there's a lot of validity to that. I don't think it was a bad decision for some people. So I did major in criminal law for the first year and did plays on the side. I thought that would always be a hobby of mine, only to have it uh, not fulfill me. And actually, the theater, the reason I switched criminal law, I might have stayed with it otherwise, is I was in a class with a professor, and he had a quiet moment with me, and I think he recognized that my heart wasn't in this, but I could probably do well. And he said, um, I want you to realize that 95% of the people in the courtroom are guilty, and it's not because the justice system collects the guilty folk. It's really because they're not, it's a business for them as well. They're not going to spend the money to prosecute a case if the person is not provable to be guilty. That they look at it, it, it they'll let guilty people off all the time if they do not have the evidence to find them guilty and spend the pack, you know, the taxpayers' dollars right. to put that into a courtroom. He said, so you need to be able to know that chances are 9.5 out of 10 you're getting somebody guilty off. And if you have the talent and the brains, and he said you have the looks in the courtroom that you can sway a jury, he said you'll probably get off guilty people and you need to know that now and be able to live with that. And he said, I can look at you and you can't live with that. And he was absolutely right because I'm far too sensitive, far too emotional to, to live with knowing I had a part in that. So that's really why I switched majors was this great professor recognizing where I was at 20. <laughs> so, uh, and then I, I went to the, I switched to theater, and there was a bit of a surprise and concern, and they blamed Barbara, and, <laughs> and Barbara was like, oh, I didn't say a word, but, so uh, it all worked out. As far as um, leaving to be an executive, that was all, it's all part and parcel of the same path, and that, it, it, after doing so much theater in L.A. and, and being so broke, I had to, I, I've always had the du duality of I can be an executive if I put my mind to it. It's a certain skill, almost stage managing theater to me, so I shift, shift gears. And it was the same thing and not being fulfilled and knowing ultimately that that isn't what I wanted to do. It's not my dream. And I just want people to be responsible for their dreams. I know so many people who have them but don't actually do something. I know a lot of people walk out to me and say I want to be a writer, but they don't have a script. They just talk about their stories and they want you to write it for them. And I think that everyone, if you have a dream, no matter what it is, it's, it's pretty much your responsibility to make it come true and, and to live that dream away. So and that's you, why I quit. Do you think that working for Sony actually helped you a little bit more realize the business side of I, what was going on? I, I think it does. It shows you both people's point of view. It helps you in meetings understand what their needs and goals are and that um, everyone's trying to help. Everyone has the same ultimate goal, which is to make the best show they can. The best
best movie, the best TV show. Everyone wants to help. And uh, I think if you remember that, instead of looking at everyone as an adversary, but rather your partner, I think it helps uh, you know, achieve your goals. What was the first story you ever wrote? The first story I ever wrote? Uh, I was really obsessed with Joan of Arc when I was little. I used to play the record over and over, and it had a fleur de lis on it. When I was very little, which is why the fleur de lis became so uh, em em such an emblem for me. I think because there's an, I, it's sort of Joan of Arc is iconic, yes, but also she she followed her belief system. Whether now people are saying she's actually bipolar, <laughs> somebody theorized to hear the voices. Either way, whatever she believed in, she. Uh, she followed it to the to the unfortunate end, but she she never she wasn't afraid, and I think as a young girl that was a great symbol for me. So I used to write stories about Joan of Arc. I guess you could call it fan fiction. <laughs> in that, I guess I took yeah. her and I put her in other stories and I you know, made them up for her. Um, do you have a great memory, or is your mind filled with stories that you, um, that you find everyday stuff sort of slips your mind? Or I guess in the past, because now as an executive producer, you really can't have that happen anymore. Anyway. Great memories. Yeah. Just in, like just in general, do you, you know, like yeah, there are always great memories. I mean, I have most things that I've experienced end up in some form or another in a, you know, in my work, in, in a movie or in a television show or something. I mean, I, they all end up there because I draw from my experiences. People who tell me things. Um, you know, one of the I, this isn't necessarily a, a memory, but when Rob sent me the final cut of. When Fates Glide, he, he sent it to me early so I could see it and have my own impressions rather than wait for television. To see it on TV, which is what you know, usually happens. Um, I watched it and it didn't occur to me to call him. And that's when I realized that like, Rob is such a sensitive, wonderful man. He called me and about three hours later thinking I was traumatized or hated it. He goes, well, I, what did you think? What did you think? And it was just his caring to know what I thought really meant a lot to me. And that's a great memory. So I sent him this uh, DVD of this Japanese film called Afterlife, which is, uh, you go to an afterlife, a middle ground after you die, and you're allowed to only keep one memory of your life with you and take it on and everything else is wiped clean so that you can start pretty fresh and whatever this journey is going to be. And I, I just wanted to let him know that you know, he had helped create a memory for me. So, but that movie itself, I use, I use that movie, Afterlife, and Defending Your Life quite a bit in my own mythology. Like, I don't want to see a... That's my daughter. <laughs> Sit down, Charlotte. I don't want to see... Um, I mean, I worry about what would be on the screen from Defending Your Life that I didn't do, the opportunities I didn't take. And then in Afterlife, you sort of conversely, I wonder what I would take with me. It's the most important. I don't really think I have that yet. I mean, the, the, the closest I can think of is really my daughter's birth, which is what most people would say anyway. But the, the seeing this creature that looked like a prop almost come out of you and know that that's going to be connected to you for the rest of your life and then having her finally open her eyes and being blurry and look at you that was yeah is that connection it's kind of electric this little thing it's going to have its own life and our own choices and our own thoughts and that you're part of bringing her here so. do you think that women or girls 